Hello, we're going to be concluding the book of Hebrews today. We're going to be in chapter 13, which is a little unusual. It's almost like an appendix, and yet it continues some of the comparisons of Jesus and uh, Moses. And yet it's, it's like a letter here. Remember, we talked about it being a sermon that seems to be turned into a letter. It doesn't start like a letter, but it ends like a letter. And this chapter is very Pauline in its wording and phrasing. Now, I still think we can tell that it's not Paul by the way in verse um, 22, 23, where he says, our brother Timothy. Every time Paul writes, he says, Timothy, our brother. So I don't think it's Paul, but I think it's someone who is familiar with Paul and Timothy and their world mission and uh, apparently um, <laughs> picked up on some of his ways of writing. Now, in verses, uh, it seems the paragraph division of my Williams translation is a bit off. I think 1 through 6 forms a unit, and 7 through 17 forms a unit. Now, 1 through 6 is really kind of a list of imperatives about the Christians relating to other Christians. Now, it's going to be culturally conditioned by the first century needs, but the principles are universal. So let's look at it. You must let your, and this of course is a present imperative, there's a series of these, you must let your brotherly love, this is the word Philadelphia. Phileo means brotherly love, Adolphos means brother, brotherly love. Uh, now, before we make too radical a distinction between agape and phileo, we ought to see John chapter 21, where Jesus seems to use them in parallel ways. And in and, and Greek literature in general, phileo and agape are pretty much synonymous, so I don't know we can make a big deal about the difference here. Uh, notice where it mentions, uh, by the way, you might want to see Psalms 133.1 where this idea of brotherly love is continued. Um, I've listed two verses in your outline, 1 John 3, 16 and 1 John 4, 7 through 21, that describe this kind of love, a love that flows through us from God. It's not originating ourselves. Number two, do not remain neglectful of hospitality to strangers, another present imperative. And you have to recognize that in the first century there were no holiday inns, uh, the ends of that day were notorious houses of prostitution and very expensive, and Christians could not stay there and would not stay there, and it was encumbered upon believers to truly help other believers when they were coming to town on some mission enterprise or just passing through. The New Testament is replete on this. Uh, you might want to see Matthew uh, 25, 35. You might want to see Romans 12, 13. Uh, Titus 1, 8. 1 Peter 4, 9. Uh, excuse me, 1 Timothy 3, 2, where it's a qualification for pastors, and the whole book of 2 John seems to deal with this. In the Didache, which is an early church uh, book, it's not a canonical book, but it was written during the same period, chapter 11, verses 4 through 6 says, if, if a Christian comes and stays one day, you are to help him. If he stays two, if it's needful, fine. But if he stays longer than two, he's a false teacher. And if he asks for more than bread or, or sandwich when he leaves, he's a false teacher. So it's obvious there was some abuse of this, but it was still a mandate for Christians to be open-hearted, open-handed, open-homed. Okay? Uh, notice it says, For it by some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now this doesn't mean that you may get an angel at your house someday. I think it's a reflection back to uh, Genesis 18, where Abraham entertains the angels, and Genesis 19, where Lot entertains the angels. And I think this is the illusion, instead of the Asia Minor tradition about Zeus visiting people. Uh, notice it says in verse 3, continue to remember those who are in prison. In verse 3 is the third criteria, remember those who are in prison, reflecting back Matthew 25, 31 through 46. But it also, I think, it says, in those who are ill-treated. Now, we learn back from chapter 10 in Hebrews, there had been some Christian persecution, and these believing Jews had helped and identified to some extent with them, and they're being encouraged in this now. This remember again is a present middle imperative. You yourself, as a habitual command, do this as a manner of life. Now, let's see. Notice where it mentions the next one. Um, marriage must be held in honor by all and marriage relationships kept sacred. Now, there seems to be a growing tendency in this chapter about some false teachers. Now, they don't seem to be the unbelieving Jews that we talked about, but they're going to be real picky about food laws and about marriage. Now, this doesn't sound like Jews. Jews never had a problem in affirming that marriage was the will of God back from Genesis. They always said it was God's norm for all men. It was the Greek uh, aesthetics that so impacted the church that somehow not being married was a holier state and not uh, 
uh, helping the body, whatever it wanted, don't give it to it. If it's cold, uh, make it cold. If it's hungry, don't feed it. And so this, this has really swept into the church in the early centuries, and it's still with us today, that somehow the more things you don't do, the holier you are. Well, that is not true here. So I don't think it's the Jewish unbelievers, but seems to be Greek false teachers. Now, I want to say to you that marriage has always been God's norm. It is not holier to be not married or holier to be married. There is a gift of celibacy. It's God's will, and the norm is that. Now, I want you to look at 1 Timothy 4, 3, where some of these false teachers were putting down marriage, and there's still some today. Now, it says the marriage relations. The Greek here is the marriage bed. Sex is a gift from God. It is good and wholesome. It is God's idea. As all gifts from God, man has perverted it, but the sexual act is not a, a, uh, a morally negative thing. It's a morally neutral thing. It's our attitude and uh, our practice. God has set some bounds on it, and so I think it's important we hear that. Persons who are sexually vicious and immoral, God will punish. Now, the first word is fornication. It's primarily any kind of sexual sin is the way the word was used by Paul's day. The second word is adultery. Now, in the Old Testament, there is a distinction between adultery and fornication. Fornication would be extramarital sex sins, and adultery would be uh, marital sex sins. And, but by the New Testament time, the words uh, were basically general words. Now, notice in verse 5, you must have a turn of mind that is free from avarice. A another present imperative. And again, this turn of mind, King James has the word conversation. It's used again down in verse um, 6, I mean, excuse me, verse 7. But it means lifestyle, okay? And so we're talking about a lifestyle repentance that shows itself in a lack of love of silver. That's what the word avarice means, literally, is a phileo, love. It's alpha privative, no love for silver. And so it shows that there was a real problem about these false teachers and their money. And if you want to see that clearly, look at 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, and especially 1 Timothy 6.6-10, 6 through 10, okay? And we'll see the problem there. Uh, with this idea of money. Let me give you a couple of other ones. Matthew 6, 24 and Luke 12, 15 deal with this same attitude that should characterize Christians. Now, money is not the problem. It's love of money. It's the priority of money. It's our use of money, for we are stewards of God, and everything we have, we will give an account to. Now, the next one, notice it says, you must be content with what you have, for God himself has said. And then we're going to quote the Septuagint of a and there's several places in the Psalms it might come from. Now, this word contentment is a very important term. This is a present a passive participle, which means it's something that God can give us. We don't naturally have it. Now, you might want to see Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, for the class, 11 through 13, for the classical passage on content. Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in, plenty or, or need. And it's the idea of self-sufficiency, but not self-sufficiency that focuses on us but self-sufficiency because of who we are in God, knowing that all things are in his hands and he will provide us all things that we need. Now, the truth is most of us are spoiled rotten in our culture. We're materialistic and possession-oriented to the core, and we're not content with anything until we have everything everybody else in our culture has. I say to you, the real joy of the peace of Christ comes in knowing that what we have that's most precious is knowing him, not the abundance of possessions. It's a word we need to hear in our culture. Now, notice it says, I will never fail you, I will never forsake you. This is two double negatives, the strongest way in Greek to negate something doubled. And uh, this idea that he'll never forsake us, it means leave us helpless. That's a recurrent theme throughout the Bible. Genesis 28, 11, Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 8, uh, Joshua 1, 5, Isaiah 41, 17, uh, 1 Samuel uh, 41, excuse me, <laughs> I, I, I didn't misread that right. Second Chronicles 28, 20, and Isaiah 41, 17. Now, the quote here is possibly from three places. Psalms 56, verse 6 and 11, or Psalms 118, 6. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can men do to me? Now, I've written in my Bible, what can men do to me? See Romans 8, 31. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. A tribulation, persecution, famine, nakedness, sword, peril, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, in verse 7 begins a, a new section that's going back to another illusion about these food laws and comparing the food laws with the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. You must not forget another present imperative. 
And the, the idea here is your former leaders. Now, leaders are mentioned over in verse 17 and again down in verse 24. And we're seen to be referring to three different groups here in this way. Chapter 11 referred to Old Testament saints, okay? Now, this is the same idea about the, your former leaders are those who brought the gospel to these, these people but had since died, okay? And then we have the current leaders mentioned in verse 17. So the, the flow of the message is follow the example of the men of God of the Old Testament. Follow the example of the men of God who first brought you the gospel. Follow the example of Jesus Christ, and that's brought in the next verse. And then follow the example of your current leaders. So we're admonished. Uh, wave after wave of godly men have given us what God wants in our lives. Now, for it is they who brought you the message of God. Consider how they closed their lives. This is that word conversation again. And it's used in the sense of an exodus. Or if I could put it in a uh, colloquial way, they were true to the end. And that's the idea. We're supposed to be true to the end. Imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no verb in verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Leaders may come and go. Christ is permanent. Follow those godly leaders. Follow the example of Christ seems to be the admonition here. Now, in verse 9 it says, You must stop. Present imperative with the May article, which means stop an act already in process. They were being influenced by these false teachers' asceticism. Now, you must stop being carried away with varied and strange teachings. Now, because the next uh, sentence mentions foods, and because we've talked about the abstinence of marriage as a problem, or seeing marriage in some uh, 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 perverted way, I think we're talking about some kind of Gnostic false teachers that had permeated this fellowship to some extent. For it is a good thing for the heart to be strengthened by God. Now, the heart means the whole personality, all right? Now, strengthened by God is a present passive infinitive. It's something God does. Uh, by God's strength, not by special kinds of food. Now, the Bible has dealt with this special kind of foods. It's not a big issue in our day to most people, although some are legalistic on some things they eat and drink. But it was a real issue in the first century because of the pagan culture and because of the Jewish legalism about food laws. Let me give you a few references. I hope you'll write these down, look them up, that deal with how does righteousness come. Is it through food laws or through relationship with God? Uh, Matthew 15:11. Mark 7, 18 through 23, 1 Corinthians 8, 8, Romans 14, all of it, Colossians 2, 16 through 19. Food will not bring us to God. Food will not keep us with God. It is the attitude of the heart. That's true across the board. Now, uh, from which those adhering to them have gotten no good. This is the word walking here, which is, in a, um, is the idea of lifestyle, Okay. Uh, so food laws are not going to help us spiritually. Now look at verse 10. Here we're getting back into a very difficult analogy, so follow with me. We Christians have an altar at which the ministers of the Jewish tent of worship have no right to eat. Now you would think that was referring to the Lord's Supper, wouldn't you? But you know this author throughout his argument, and he had, a, he had good opportunity several times, never draws an allusion to the Lord's Supper, not even one time. Here would have been a perfect place. But because of the context in the next few verses, it seems to me we're talking about Calvary. Now, Calvary as an altar sounds somewhat funny to us related to sacrifices, okay? But that's what the allusion seems to be. Now, have no right to eat is a legal Jewish term. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is taken into the sanctuary by the priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp, Leviticus 16, 27. So Jesus, too, in order to purify the people by his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Let us, therefore, go to him outside the camp, enduring the reproach that he endured. Now, this is the central issue of this book. The author is trying to, be, to encourage these believing Jews, still worshiping with unbelieving Jews, to make their final break with the synagogue and to come into the full light of trusting and accepting in Jesus only. And this is the idea of come outside the camp once and for all. As you can see, we're still drawing an illusion from these Old Testament uh, covenant relationships, the altar, the taken outside the camp and all that. Now, when it mentions here, um, let's see, enduring the reproach that he endured, I want to remind you that in Deuteronomy 21, 21 through 23, that being publicly impaled was a sense of a curse of God. 
And the Jews in Jesus' day, with Jesus being publicly crucified, thought that Jesus was cursed by God. That's what Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 is talking about when it says, and Jesus became a curse for us. Now, Paul's big problem initially with Jesus being the Christ is, how could the Messiah be cursed by God? But on further reflection, he understood that's exactly how he became our vicarious Messiah, is that he died in our place. And so they are to take their stand with Jesus Christ. He may look like he's ostracized. He may have been killed for treason. There may be ill repute connected with his name, but they are to fully identify with him publicly. And that's the idea here. Now, verse 14. For we have no permanent city here, but we are searching for that city. Now, this has been a constant theme. They are looking not for an earthly possession, but for a heavenly possession. And the metaphor used throughout this is the city. The city whose builder and maker is God. You might want to see chapter 11, verse 10 and 16. Chapter 12, verse 22. And I think an allusion to that is in John 14, 2, where he says, I go to prepare a place for you. My father's house has many mansions. That idea is the same idea of a city. Matter of fact, when New Jerusalem comes out of heaven in the book of the Revelation, that's the same metaphor as heaven as a city. Now, uh, verse 15. So then, through Christ, let us always offer God the sacrifice of praise. Now, isn't that a beautiful phrase, the sacrifice of praise? It comes from Psalms 50, verses 12 through 14. And I think it has two aspects from the rest of this verse. That is the speech of the lips. Now, this literally is the fruit of the lips. It seems to be a quote from the Septuagint of Hosea 14. And I can't read my own writing. Three, that glorify the name of God. And look at the next verse. And stop neglecting doing good. Well, that seems to be the second aspect of praise. One is praise with our mouths and one is praise with our lives. For you see, works do not lead us to Christ, but works are the only road away from Christ. We're not saved by our works, but we are saved unto good works. And you ought to read Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Okay? God didn't just save us to populate heaven. He saved us to win others to him, and we're going to do that by our lifestyle, attracting them to God through us. They're going to see our good works and glorify God, is the Sermon on the Mount's way of saying that. Notice where it says, to be generous, for God is highly pleased with such sacrifices as these. Great. Verse 17. Continue to obey and be submissive to your leaders. Notice, obey and uh, submit, both present, middle, in, excuse me, present, middle imperative and present, active imperative. It reminds me of Luke 6, 46. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I tell you to do? Now, we're to be submissive to the commands of Christ, and we're to understand the commands of Christ through the apostolic teaching that is presented to us by, our, by the leaders of our church. And there is a respect due the, the local church leaders, a respect and obedience if they are men of God. If they're not men of God, you ought to get men of God. If they are men of God, you ought to follow them, for they are going to give an account to God. Now, that's where it says, for they are ever watching in defense of your souls. Now, this is a present participle. It means lack of sleep through watching. Do you mean that one of the aspects of pastoring is the guarding of the flock? Yes. To me, the two primary focus of a pastor is to feed and protect the flock of God. Now, notice where it continues then, as men who will give an account of their trust. Now, I want to tell you, leadership will give an account to God. They are stewards of the gift and the circumstances that God has placed them in. Now, I don't believe we're going to stand before God for any sins that we've committed, but I believe we will stand for him for our availability and the use of our spiritual gift. And that seems to be the idea here, that leaders will give an account. Treat them in this way so that they may work with joy and not with grief. This is the word groaning. And sometimes uh, pastoring a local church can be such a tremendous blessing, and sometimes it can be the pits. Now, why Williams leave this little phrase out, I don't know. But it should be included with verse 17, uh, which is profitable to you. The, the happy contentment of your leaders is profitable to the church. The continual bickering between church and leaders causes uh, reproach on God, reproach on the leaders, and reproach on the church. Now, verse 18. Pray for me, for I am sure that I have a clear conscience, and in everything I want to live a noble life. Now, the biblical idea of a clear conscience we must be careful with the word conscience because consciences can be abused in two particular ways. It can be abused, first of all, by repeated abuse. 
the more we do something, the less our conscience is able to flag it as being evil. Secondly, sometimes culture and non-biblical traditions influence conscience as much as revelatory truth. And so we need to make sure that our clear conscience is the illuminating, illuminating of the Holy Spirit to the words and truths of Jesus found in the apostolic message which is recorded in the New Testament. Now when it says here, verse 19, and more especially do I beg you to do so, that I may very soon be brought back to you. Sounds very Pauline, doesn't it? These early preachers wanted to revisit the churches where they ministered and labored, and the author of Hebrews wanted to return to these people and be a blessing to them. Now in verse 20, we, talk, we start the closing section of this epistle, and it's very Pauline. Only in Paul and Hebrews is God called the God of peace. You say, well, that's evidence that it's a Pauline authorship. Well, I think that's true, except down in verse 23 where he says, our brother Timothy. Now, Paul never calls it brother Timothy. He always says, Timothy, our brother. And so it's, he never says that. So here's one that l sounds like Paul, and here's one that doesn't sound like Paul. So I really don't think Paul was the author for many reasons through here that I've showed you. Now, the God of peace, back in verse 20, the word peace uh, means to bring together that which was broken. Isn't that beautiful? Now, something reflects the Hebrew background of shalom, which in a Hebrew culture means the presence of blessings and the absence of problems, whichever one. Who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only allusion to the resurrection of Jesus in the entire book of Hebrews. Isn't that unusual? Who through the blood by which he ratified uh, the everlasting covenant. Now, this idea of the, the blood of his sacrifice, remember that God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus by raising him from the dead. There's nothing magical about Jesus' blood. It's simply the idea of an innocent one dying for the sinful one. So it's the vicarious, uh, sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Notice he's called by the title, The Great Shepherd of the Sheep. And there are two possible backgrounds. One is the Septuagint's use of Isaiah 63, 11, where Moses is called a shepherd. Now, if that's the background, we're comparing again the old covenant of Moses with the new covenant of Jesus by taking the titles for Moses and applying them to Jesus. But shepherd is also an Old Testament title for God, uh, Psalm 23 and many others, uh, especially at the chapter in um, Ezekiel. I've forgotten which one it is. I think it's 31 or 33. It's one of those where God's called a shepherd. You can look it up in your concordance and, and see where it is in Ezekiel. And then that, that title of God as shepherd is applied to the Messiah in John chapter 10. And so that may be the allusion here, John 10, uh, 3 through 10. Uh, but again, it's one of these tremendous Old Testament titles applied to Jesus. Notice in verse 21, perfectly fit to do his will. Now this perfectly fit is the word mature. It's used of chickens that are old enough to be brought to market. It's used of bones that have knit back together. It's used of ships being fully equipped for sea. So it seems to have two ideas. Maturity are fully equipped for the task. God never called you to do anything that he won't equip you to do. Okay, that's the idea here. Now I think you'll see Ephesians 4.12 where the goal of the church is to present every man mature in Christ. Not some, every Christian mature in Christ. He himself through Jesus Christ accomplishing through you what is pleasing to him. Notice the paradox. Through you what's pleasing to him. I've written in my Bible Philippians 2, 13, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God that is at work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. We must yield ourselves to God's will for our life. So it is God's power flowing through our receptiveness that is what God wants to do to others through us. That's, I think that's important we see that. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word amen is the Hebrew word to be firm, to be sure. And it's used of the sense of faithfulness in the Old Testament. Habakkuk 2.4 that Paul quotes so often uh, in uh, Romans 4 and Galatians. And it came to the idea of the faithfulness of God that we respond to by faith so he will make us faithful men. Now verse 22. I beg you brothers to listen patiently to this message present middle imperative. For I have written you only a short letter, and you must know that our brother Timothy has an unusual usage. Now, obviously, this man knew Timothy. We have no record of Timothy being in prison. My translation says Timothy has been released from prison. But the literal here is set at liberty. From Acts 13.3, we know this could mean for a change of assignments in ministry. That's the way it's used in Acts 13.3. 
So we think it's prison, though we have no extra canonical sources of it or anything in the Bible to show Timothy was in prison, but it may be a different ministry assignment, so we can't be certain there. It's obvious to me that he knew Timothy, that he was familiar and involved in the world mission of the Antiochian church through Paul and Barnabas and later Silas and all the others. And so the man was familiar with the terminology of Paul and the ministry of Paul and was certainly involved in it. Now, if he comes soon, uh, and I will see you get together, okay? Remember us to all your leaders. And there's that emphasis again on the leaders of the church. And to all the Christians, this is the word saints. Now, we're saints not because we live holy lives, though we should strive for that. But we're saints because we're positionally in Christ. We have the robes of righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why we're saints. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So it's positional sanctification that hopefully will work out in possessional, progressive sanctification. All right? Now, the Christians from Italy wish to be remembered to you. Now, this either means that the author was in Italy, the author was from Italy, the author was writing to Italy. And we're not sure what it means. There is some connection with the Roman church in this letter. Whether it's the author or the recipients or the, the helpers, we're just not sure. We, we just can't be dogmatic. Then it says, God's spiritual blessing be with you all. Amen. Now, the last amen is not in the Greek text. It's not in the Chester Beatty papyri. It's not in uh, Sinaiticus. I think a copyist must have dropped it down from verse 21. The early church liked to close with an amen, and it seemed he just reduplicated it, but it's not in the best text. Well, I hope you'll go back through Hebrews and outline it for yourself, and I hope it impacts your life. If one thing I ought to say is that Jesus is far superior to the Old Covenant, and the other thing in our day is we don't have to be Old Testament Christians to be New Testament saints. God bless you. I'll see you again same time, same place next week.